Hello, good morning. It's the day after Eurovision, which officially marks my third Eurovision, my second year here, which is Sunday the 17th of May 2020, 10.30 a.m. And it was quite a good Eurovision. Well, we didn't lose, let's put it that way, because they didn't have a contest, they had a celebration. And it was actually quite a good um, show. Not only, you coming up? Not only did they have um, a snippet of all the songs, but they had tributes and that paid by all the um, acts. Caspi, YouTube, Caspi, Caspi, YouTube. So that was all right. Um, the BBC had a sort of competition beforehand, the best of the pick of the previous Eurovision entries. And surprise, surprise, ABBA won. Alexander Rybeck doesn't get older. Ten years ago, and he hasn't got older. Caspi? Anyway, so that was last night. I had my pizza and beer and ice cream. Traditional. Oh, I've still got ice cream. Um, what else is there? I've just discovered something really annoying. Apart from Caspi trying to chew everything, the bottom bit on my phone case, my new phone case, the microphone port needs making bigger because it's only good when you're not using a plug. So I need to make it bigger so the plug sits down properly. Um, what else is there? There was people outside my flat for about an hour and a half, two hours last night, having a party. Three women outside, sitting together, having a drink. And this is still during lockdown. They've only eased certain requirements, but everyone on this estate thinks lockdown's over. I mean, they never really treated it with respect anyway on this estate. Um... I'm still locked in. I'm still waiting for the council to get back to me on quite a lot of stuff. They're just ignoring me totally. Oh, what else is there? People are worried about recession. As far as I can see, if people are locked in, they're not spending money. And if they're getting 80% of their wages paid and they're not spending money, vis-a-vis, -vis, a lot more people will have a lot more savings. Unless they're just, oh, I'm sitting at home, bored, let's go on the Amazon or eBay and buy stuff. In which case, it's their fault. But as far as I can see, the majority of people in this country should be a bit better off than they were before we went into lockdown. But... Sadly, in two to three weeks' time, we are going to have another peak because you give them an inch, they take 300 miles, these people. And so people are visiting friends and family. All this, you can meet one other person not in your household as long as you keep social distance and stay outside. That's not happening. And the police are between... A rock and a hard place. It really needs the military to enforce it, not the police. This is like, this is not a police issue. It's a social crowding issue. It should be the military that steps in. It should have been the military all along and the police helping the military. Because it's this policing by consent that people just ignore. The police don't want to take away your liberties and your rights and your freedoms, but on the other hand, they're tasked with taking away your liberties, your rights and your freedoms because of lockdown. And it's not right. That is normally the duty of the police, of the um, military, to enforce society's main rules. 
the law is the police. But laws that we've passed recently regarding COVID, it's removing certain rights, and that is normally the military. The police are there to uphold your rights, not to take them away. And it just feels wrong for the police to do this. But the military are used to it. They've got no qualms about enforcing, in effect, martial law. You know, being told when there's a curfew and things like that. But they haven't even used the curfew word. You can come in and out whenever you want. And they should have put a curfew on. But there we are. Such is life. Lessons will be learned, I guarantee it. Again, I've been hearing that for 53 years. Lessons will be learned, my thought. Um, what else is there? The estate seems pretty quiet. We had the police round here yesterday running after someone. So, probably drugs again. Uh, I'm up to date with the videos. I've actually finished yesterday scheduling all my videos. I'm up to 38. I've got another now three on the phone, which I need to put up. So this video is going out sometime in July. Considering it's May now, we're talking like a two month gap, which is fine. That's a nice distance for me. That's what I wanted originally. And I've also found the right spot for the repeater, so I'll get decent Wi-Fi in the bedroom in the house. I've ordered some a double socket so I can put the Wi-Fi and the camera on the same PowerPoint, just behind the door. And then I can put a network cable instead of the Wi-Fi for the front camera, which should ease things a little. And then that will have a proper connection back to the main router and the internet and things will work a bit better. Um, I had another delivery of food yesterday. Lots of pre-cooked stuff. I can't eat pre-cooked stuff. Anyone that knows me will know that I won't eat stuff that I've not seen cooked unless it's come from a, a quote, a professional kitchen, a pizza place, a Chinese takeaway, an Indian restaurant, that sort of thing. But if it's just, you know, this is what someone in the church has cooked, no, I won't eat that. I never have. And, you know, I did attempt it, but there was an eyelash in one of them, so the rest of them have just gone straight into the bin. I've not even saved the plastic cases. I've got more than enough of them. Um, what else? Apart from the haircut yesterday. Oh, the boys seem to be a lot healthier since I put them on to one meal a day and biscuits. Merlin is running around with the other two playing there and he hasn't done that in a while so I'll keep them on there one meal a day. Mental health grading between minus five and plus five I would say minus two still. It does feel like I'm the only one on the estate that's in lockdown. Everyone else is just coming, and they always have been coming and going whenever they want. The only people I see in lockdown are the people I don't actually see. Yeah, oh, I don't know. So I'm going to try and do my three videos today. Do my case. That little hole. We'll need to make that a little bit bigger. It is a bit of a weird hole anyway, because it's it's flat on one side, and I think that's what the problem is. They've tried to make it more of a aesthetic hole than a usable hole. So I'm going to have to try and work out how I'm going to do that without breaking the case. I think I just need to scrape that little bit of flat away. But I'll work that out. Um... Eurovision, recorded, 
I've still got little bits of the BBC bit of Eurovision left. I've got Top of the Pops 2, which goes back. It basically goes back over what the first bit of Eurovision, the Graham Norton tribute, did. So I may not watch all that. Um, the speakers seem to be... Oh, excuse me. The speakers seem to be perfectly set up now. I don't think I'm getting any vibration off that one. I might check it again later. But, as it is, I need to have a little tidy up again. I've got that, the Bruger box in front of me still, and that's been there for like three weeks now. So, I need to put these things away. I've still got the, the eSIM that I ordered. That's come. So, I may use that later and see if it is any different to Vodafone. But I'd rather stay on Vodafone because not only are they cheaper, but I know it works. And the customer support ain't that bad. I know when you get online to someone and you talk and you spend 25 minutes going through the same stuff you tried like the day before or the day before that. But that's just the way that IT set up there. It's not, it's not like IT support when I was doing it. It was a personal thing in IT. You know, you could pick up the same call. People would pass you back to the same um, support person. If they knew you were having an ongoing problem, they'd pass you back so you knew what you'd already tried. But they don't do that there, it's just a script. And they have to try, before they can move on to the next bit of the script, they have to do the first bit. Have you reset the router? Yes. Have you moved the router? Hey, you have you tried the SIM on another phone? Yes. Blah, 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 blah. Not realising that maybe the reason on another phone you can put your SIM card in. You know? I mean, in theory, I don't go out, so I've just got a mobile number and a router, but I could actually use the router as a phone as well. So, in which case, I wouldn't have a mobile, but I just find it a bit more convenient to have a mobile phone. So, I've got two SIMs. They have, Vodafone have reduced the price, so I'm only paying 40 a month now for the phone and the router SIM, and that's locked in for two years. Uh, not a lot else is happening. The usual cry from the motorists coming out on Facebook now about why is congestion charge being re-implemented. The one good thing that has come out of this COVID-19 deal with TfL is that children aren't going to have free travel anymore. I've never thought that was a good idea. It overcrowds buses at the peak of the day because everyone's trying to get to work as all the children are trying to get to and from school. And apart from anything, on average, most people live within walking distance of their school. So you're stopping them exercising because given a choice between free travel there and walking, most people choose free travel. Whereas everyone at the same time of introducing free travel, there's been government guidance on getting children to exercise more because of the obesity problem. It was a bad idea to begin with. And now people on freedom passes and you know free travel passes, they're back to being restricted after 9.30, which is perfect. Because you know, there's no need. If you get an appointment, a hospital appointment for instance, you just contact them and say, Well, I can't get there for 9.30. I have to do it because I can't travel any time before 10 o'clock really I have to let the crowds go down even when we're not in lockdown and so it's more of a hassle but as long as you contact them in advance you get another appointment for the same and it's not a hassle you just I mean if you're making a doctor's appointment you should be able to walk there it takes longer to get 
a bus to a doctor's when he does the walk to it mostly because of the 10 or 15 minute wait okay if you are infirm and you cannot walk then you just have to arrange your life around when you get the travel not everything in life is free or should be free the NHS is another one but don't get me started on paying for appointments as a refundable basis to stop people just bulk booking appointments yes they still do it and they just occasionally ring up and cancel they don't always cancel just in case if you've got two or three children I've actually heard it um, where people book like Monday's appointments in advance and then cancel it or not as the case might be whereas that would be stopped if there was a £10 um, refundable cost so they every appointment costs you £10 you turn up you get the £10 back if you don't turn up the surgery gets it it's an automatic fine in effect so if you want to book in advance then do so you have to pay for all the appointments and if you don't turn up no cancellation if you do not turn up because otherwise cancellation would be in the same boat it would be if you don't turn up so you get to the doctor not the reception you get to your doctor's appointment it would be marked up on their system and you will get the refund so in effect it's still free at the point of um, use you're just enforcing a fine for those that don't turn up easy peasy and yes I would make it 10 not a pound not a fiver it needs to be something that you know people will miss okay you will have people that think a tenner is you know, nothing but then with those people a lot of them generally don't both book I've worked in the NHS for three years so I know what's going on even some doctors that I've mentioned this to thought it was a good idea but no one wants to put their head above the parapet and actually say oh let's do this it's not a bad idea I do wonder about these figures coming out of the government at the moment about the deaths it's currently hovering on average about 450 down from about 600 a week ago the COVID-19 deaths that is I worry about it because we don't we the public don't know if instructions or guidance has been issued to coroners or doctors certifying deaths that if there's multiple cause, multiple possible causes of death not to put COVID-19 down as the cause don't know they might be doing it they might not be doing it it just seems odd that suddenly there's an average drop of about 250 a day and that's across all settings as they say and that just seems odd now why would it suddenly drop when by my experience more and more people are actually not complying with the lockdown even the new eased the lockdown they saw it as it's over we've got people going to the parks people going to the beaches yes you're allowed to but the spirit of the law is stay home going to parks and beaches is still supposed to be just for exercise or meeting one person from another um, household at a social distance not to go to parks and beaches for well they say you can sunbathe and you know do things as a family but it is a bit confusing because they tell you you can do this and that and the other and then they say well we want you to stay at home as much as possible and even I'm confused by the latest request they say you can go to the beaches but we want you to stay home well how can you go to the beach and stay home how can you meet up with people not in your household and stay home is there still an hour's limit? No. Is there a distance limit? No. 
it's just it's just so confusing. Life is confusing for me at the best of times, but when it comes to laws and rules, I normally see things quite clearly. But if I'm confused by the latest guidance, and that's the other thing, is it law or is it guidance? What does the law say? What are the police going to enforce? It doesn't matter what the law says. It depends what the police instructions are. And on the law, the police instructions were a bit vague. You know, it's not find people straight away. It's talk to them, encourage them to comply with the law. Then if they don't, then fine them. Then if they still don't do it, then you arrest them. And it's all a bit... It should be more... This is life and death we're talking. This is like... It has to be treated like the Black Death from the... 1700s or 1600s um, it shouldn't be please do what we ask you this is what the law says it should be if we catch you you will be fined and it should be a reasonable fine not £30 it should be more like 250 as a proper deterrent £30 people would spend on a night out in the pub so they just see it as a, well, I'm not going to the pub, we'll pay £30, we can go out, do whatever we want, if we get caught. That's what people would think like. Whereas £250 or more, they would think twice. They'd only have to get caught once and it would go round. And quite frankly, it's easy enough to catch people. Just come to an estate and walk around. And most of the estates in this borough, based on my experience here, it's a lawless entity. The council don't want to do anything. The police are... It's like running in a mouse wheel for the police. I feel so sorry for it because for the police to be effective on estate, they need support from the council and they're not getting it. In my experience, they are not getting the support they need from the council. They're getting plenty of support from the residents, but it's the council that needs to support the police as well. And if they're not, the police are ineffective. They're doing their best, but it, they can't... It is policing by consent, remember, which means it needs us to help the police. I mean, it is getting to the point where... And I've never really totally agreed with policing by consent. As some of you will know. I've mentioned it in videos before. Policing by consent. It's like asking a child not to be naughty. It's The child turns around and says, what are you going to do? And all the police can say is, well, nothing. And there really, really is, unless the council step in and assist the community and the police, council estates are a law to themselves. They are human rights have gone, rights in law have gone. Even the council make up rules to avoid coming on estates. And I think this is part of the problem with my ongoing issue with housing. Because I think the housing officers are afraid of coming onto a state. And I don't know why, because they're the ones that put the tenants in here. So do they think that most tenants are just not going to respect them? Because at the end of the day, it's up to the council to make themselves respected. Okay. The council have often said there's an awful lot of people that don't speak English on the state. In which case, the council put those people on the estates in the first place. They must have been able to communicate with them, so communicate with them. Don't just use the lack of English as an excuse not to be effective on the estate. Not everyone doesn't speak English on the estate. I mean, the majority of people I've seen do speak English. They may speak other languages, but they do speak English. 
So communication isn't the problem. So what is the problem with council people coming onto estates? I really, it's not just Waltham Forest. It seems to be a lot of councils have problems with housing and actually interacting with their tenants. But I don't know. It's almost as though the housing departments have been given carte blanche to not be oversight by another department. Thank you, Caspi. So I don't know. I mean, me and a few other tenants before lockdown were trying to help out the council and we weren't getting any thanks for it. And the council are very slow in doing anything. And there's no excuse given for it. And they don't get back to you saying, oh, we're getting permission for this or spend permission. When this lockdown is over, hopefully, in cooperation with a few people I know in the council, hopefully things will improve. Because communication needs to be increased. Proper customer service needs to be trained. Everyone needs to talk to each other in a respectful way. Disability rights, for instance, as far as I can see, they're being ignored. In as much as people with anxiety, like myself, don't accept private calls. Never have, never will. Especially from a public body. Why should a public organisation have a private phone number? No one in the last nine years since I've been asking that question has been able to give me a satisfactory answer. The only sort of answer I've ever got was, well, it's just a phone system. It's like, remember the old adage, a bad workman blames his tools? Well, it's blaming your tool. A phone system is a tool. You use the tool in the best way and if you're not using it correctly then it's your fault not the tools it's not the phone system at all it's what you told people to install it on and nearly all phone systems are digital now there's not many analog PABXs out there so it's not excusable anymore in this day and age it's not excusable to have private numbers from public organisation. It's not acceptable anyway. For good marketing practice and good customer relations, all numbers should be disclosed. Even the police. Because let's face it, if everyone apart from the police disclosed their number, what is the difference between the police advertising they're calling you and being the only people withholding your number? Everyone will know that a withheld number is the police. So why not just advertise your number anyway? And it's like I've said to councils, across the board, you can easily set a standard, it doesn't even have to be, I mean, customer services would say, you put the main switchboard number on as an advert. But Barkin and Dagnan didn't even use a real number, they used an old number, their old exchange number, which was okay, as long as it was a number that was advertised that everyone knew that was what they are advertising. It does seem daft that in this era, where we've got digital exchanges that are easily configurable, that they wouldn't have direct numbers for each department. DDI numbers for every department. So if you get a call from rents, for instance, you can ring back rents and they can trace it. Or housing, you can get through to the housing number. But as I see it, <coughs> excuse me, um, Waltham Forest, un unless it's internal, which it must be, they don't advertise separate numbers for each department. It's the main switchboard number and you have to go for a menu or talk to a human. And it's just, it's so antiquated and backwards for people still to do that. 
Whereas if you want to get through to housing and you had a housing number, you just call housing. And it would bypass the switchboard and free them up to take proper inquiries rather than people just hanging on for main switchboard to be put onto housing anyway. So direct num direct inward dialing for each department, not necessarily for each individual, but housing, rents, repairs, all should have separate numbers. Not going through a menu system. No one really likes menu systems. They were only ever put in place to delay and deter people from calling. They were never put in place to actually assist with customer service. The whole idea behind telephone menu systems was as a deterrent to cut down on the number of calls. A bit like the £10 deposit for, you know, doctor's appointment. It's to stop people actually abusing the system. Whereas if people were given respect and responsibility, then they would just dial the department they thought they needed. And there'd be less anger and less frustration on the phone because they hadn't just spent 10 minutes going through a menu system to be put on hold for maybe 15, 20 minutes. If they had DDI to each department, for instance, then you would just be held ringing until a line freed up and then he'd be put through to someone in that department. And there'd be less anger and less frustration from people calling. You imagine, you just called a direct number and you had to wait 10 minutes and then you got through straight to a person. Or would you rather be on a menu system for about 10 minutes trying to work it out and going back in? Because not all of us can work menu systems. Especially where the options aren't there for the bit you want. Or you don't know where it's supposed to be going. You normally have to go through, especially on the Wolf and Forest one, there's no let me go to the switchboard on the first menu. This is why I say it, it's used as a deter deterrent. You normally have to go through three or four menus before you get to please hold the line, we'll put you through to the next operator. And that should be on the first one. Press one to go through to an operator. But they won't do it because they're deterring people from calling it. And that just proves it. Otherwise it would be, do you want to go through to the menu system or do you want to hold for an operator? Press one for an operator. And everyone would press one. I guarantee everyone would press one. So the money, those thousands of pounds they spent on a menu system, wasted. Anyway, I'm rambling now. I've noticed I'm rambling. I've got a little bit of washing up to do. I need to motivate myself to do some laundry because that's piled up again. So I might put the bedding on because that's been sitting there for about a week now. So I'll put the bedding on and then I can change the sheets next Friday, which will be just about in time. But I need to put the throw on as well to stop the cat fur getting all over the mattress. Do they? Um... Right, onwards and upwards, let's try and repair this case so I don't have to keep taking it apart because that won't be much of a case. Thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, don't like if you want. Um, I've noticed some people have been putting some nasty comments on and they seem to be anonymous people. You know who you are and you know what sort of comments. I won't have racist comments or even just racist advertising on my channel so you can put any comments you want but I do review all my comments and if there's anything that I think is offensive or wrong or rude wrong not so much but if it's rude or possibly illegal freedom of speech is one thing but I don't want to go around upsetting people on purpose or having my channel used as a tool to upset people. 
from people who only even knew their real name. So you will get dealt with. I'll report you and block you and I will not accept it at all. So I look forward to all your comments, but if I think your comment is just, I don't mind you having a go at me, but just having general random racist remarks that didn't even relate to anything I put on the video, won't have it. The comment needs to be related to the video. And if it isn't, it's likely to get deleted and blocked. This Remember, these videos are for my benefit, not yours. But I'm putting them up and releasing them in case it helps someone. In case there's someone out there in a similar position to me. And it might help them to know they're not alone in there are other people in similar situations to yourself. And if you are in that position, leave me a comment. I will look forward to talking to you again shortly. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.